All right, so um, again, good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Murphy, Assistant Director of Leadership and Civic Engagement here at Embry-Riddle. Thank you all so much for coming on uh, to talk tonight. Um, a big thing we wanted to cover um, kind of as a continuation of the conversation that happened last Friday following our vigil for uh, Mr. George Floyd is a reflection a bit on some of our shared humanity, um, some of the things that, that bring us together, unite us in a common bond, but also recognizing and celebrating some of the things that make us different. Uh, there's a thousand million different ways in which we're different and a thousand million different ways in which we are all one. And I'm excited to hear some of the thoughts uh, that everyone has tonight to share towards these ends um, or towards these topics. Um, as we go through, we're, we're gonna kind of split this time up into a little bit of, of discussion. Um, the facilitators have some, some questions and areas we wanna touch on. And we don't want to cut anyone short. Um, a lot of what was said on Friday has proven to be so meaningful and impactful and very valuable. And we value what all of y'all have to say and what you think. And so as we, um, as we go on um, and have the conversation, just please share what's on your mind, on your heart, but be considerate of time as we move forward. We are, we're gonna to aim to end right about 6.30 on, on tonight. And so thank you for your attention during all this time. And as we proceed, we'll use the hand raising um, function on Zoom. If you have something verbal you'd like to say, if you'd like to type out a comment, uh, there are two people you can send your comments to. One is, uh, Jessica Murphy, she is the host. So when you click to type a comment, you'll see uh, message host. And then the other one is Nagar Afshar. She's one of the co-hosts. Her name reads, please submit your comments here. So I think that's pretty straightforward. We should be able to, uh, to utilize that very well. And so, and then they'll, you know, filter that and make sure there's not anybody saying anything uh, inappropriate. I don't imagine there will be because we're Ember Riddle, we're awesome. But, um, and then they'll post that into the group chat for everyone to see. And so, yeah, again, we, we look forward to some engaging conversation um, at approximately the six o'clock hour. We intend to shift the discussion a little bit from, again, some of the things that we're, we're thinking, feeling, experiencing into some actionable areas for moving forward and making progress with our Embry-Riddle community. So we're very, very excited, especially for that part, as we can kind of come together and share some ideas and thoughts as to how we can really and truly make lives better for folks here, uh, here in our community. Um, so joining me tonight kind of as co-facilitators, um, I mentioned Jessica and Nagar, also Chaplain Keck is on standby um, with his wisdom and grace. And then uh, one of our fantastic and amazing enterprising students, Rebecca Moo. And Rebecca, I'll let you introduce yourself and kick us off. I was on mute. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who is here. It really means a lot. And um, just before we get started, I just wanted to say, you know, college is a place where we are supposed to grow and we're supposed to become our own people. And that's something that we need to recognize in a sense of, especially our opinions, right? Like we are raised to think in a certain way and college is here for us to grow separate of that, to either further that opinion or change it. That is up to you, but it's important and it's your duty as a student and as a person uh, to recognize that. And I challenge you within this time of this Zoom call and even you know, out of this and when we go into the fall, to really challenge yourself and, and think, okay, like, are these opinions really my opinions? And if they are, then do they have base? Like do research and think about it. And it's also something to recognize that we go to a very privileged school. Um, we go to an incredible university that has amazing resources um, and obviously is not cheap. So um, making sure that you try to empathize with communities or people who are at our university and, you know, just because it makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean that you should step away from it. I mean, for my pilots out there, if you're uncomfortable with stalls, I mean, who cares? You got to do it to get your license. So in that case, you know, you got to think of it like that. You have to take that step forward to get out of that comfort zone to grow yourself. And um, something to kind of start off the conversation is I just wanted to know, like, what are the things that some of you have seen or experienced, um, things that have impacted you or even changed your opinion within the last couple of weeks or even during you know all of quarantine 
and kind of want to get the conversation started from there. And feel free to just go at it. And so as a reminder, use the raise hand function and then uh, in the order in which your hand is raised, we'll unmute you and we'll hear your thoughts. All right, Natalie, I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Okay, can everybody hear me? We got you. Okay, uh, so something I learned in the last couple of weeks since, you know, everything kind of shifted in our country was uh, talking to family members can be extremely hard. Um, and something that I've really had to challenge myself with is that there are you know, four generations of family members that my family talks to on a pretty regular basis, including my parents. And they don't necessarily share the same viewpoints or they don't have the same resources of information that I've had. So having to, you know, learn how to shift my language and having some really, uh, frankly, uncomfortable conversations just because they needed to happen um, has been a really big challenge. Um, but something that I've grown a lot from. Um, and I would encourage anybody that's, you know, has family members that maybe you hear um, speaking certain opinions or that you have facts to and science to, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to speak up. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be really hard, especially because you love them and that they're your family. But it's been really necessary. It's It's been kind of honestly kind of cool to see the perspective of some of my family members change slowly over the past couple of weeks. Um, and I would encourage everybody to take that step. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Anyone else, is there anything that's been particularly impactful? Um, oh, McCormick, awesome. should be unmuted here. If it takes. <laughs> Am I unmute it yet? <laughs> it sounds like, there it goes. Okay, I clicked it three times, I swear. Yeah, and I think I was clicking it when you were clicking it too, because oh. I was <laughs> Sorry about that, yeah. So, I am the wife of one of the professors here at Embry-Riddle and Mike and I participated on Friday and one of the things that we I know we both came back you know from that very moving experience was the importance of listening and I mean we we heard a lot of what you know, you guys were sharing, but then for me, it really kind of lit a fire about, you know, I think that there's a lot that I need to educate myself about. And I think this goes to, I think it was Natalie that was just speaking about being courageous to talk to family members and it might be friends. It might even be that your courage is, you're in on social media and you need to explain to somebody that you are not comfortable with the way they are discussing a topic, you know, to kind of like highlight that you're uncomfortable with something. But one of the things that I really <laughs> found absolutely incredible was watching the documentary 13. And it's Ava, um, pardon me if I say her, her name wrong, Ava Duvernay. Um, it was, really important to see what ha what our country has gone through and what it has created since the emancipation of slavery. And I think anybody that is trying to find the words or the motivation or kind of put together in their mind, maybe what racism is and what it isn't, this is so powerful to watch that documentary. So that that's just my little, uh, that's, that's what I'm, I'm telling my family members to do, quite frankly. When you're talking about, you know, talking to family members, I have told specific family members that I need you to watch this. 
So thank you. Oh, that's awesome. We appreciate that recommendation. All right, Daniel, uh, you're up next. Go ahead, Daniel. How's it going? Uh, so I guess uh, uh, my question has to do in regards to what uh, Embry Riddle plans to do to increase diversity on campus. If that, uh, so uh, I got out of the military back in July and I started school on campus in August at the Daytona Beach. And uh, I think that I noticed is that there really isn't that many minorities um, around campus. And I'm not saying that that's the, uh, the school's fault. Um, I just want to know if the school has any kind of plan to outreach to communities uh, of color, uh, minority communities, to get them involved uh, or want them to go to Embry Riddle. Just because I've, uh, in my time in the military, I met plenty of people of color that had never been on a flight prior to them shipping off to boot camp. Um, and it's that disconnect between the minorities and the aviation community, I think that's affecting the diversity on campus. And I wouldn't know if the school had any sort of like plan, start, uh, I guess, an outreach program um, to kind of boost uh, minorities on campus, just because it's kind of disheartening not feeling represented at the school that you go to. No, thank you, Daniel. That's a that's a great question. Um, I don't have that specific answer for you right now. Um, you know, some of that is a bit beyond my scope of work. We we have a couple of administrators who are on the call right now, um, and we can we can get um, you know I've got your name already written down here, Daniel Remo. Um, we can get back to you, or if they would like to raise their hands in the chat and and respond verbally, um, that's also an option. But part of again kind of what we mentioned at the last half hour of this conversation is going to be some more brainstorming for ideas for very tangible ways forward to increase diversity and and respect for people um, of all different backgrounds uh, here at the riddle campus so thank you for posing that question now that's a, that's a very very good one you know what is a tangible result what is a tangible action so thank you for that So I, I don't see any other hands up right now. So Sean. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I didn't raise my hand. My, my apologies. <laughs> that's right. You're the president. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention. I want to uh, address Daniel there. Um, you know, um, there, there are some pretty serious efforts that the university undertakes through the recruitment effort. Um, and, um, you know, I think if you look at last year, we were able to get a significant, significant um, three million dollar plus gift from one of our industry partners to help provide scholarships and things like that. But a big part of it is just um, making the connections. And I know in the last couple of years since I've been here, we've we've really started going to schools that perhaps uh, high schools, I should say, that we wouldn't go to in the past because maybe the students were in a certain my understanding, I was told at least a socioeconomic level that might not be affordable, but now with scholarships, we are sending you know, recruiters to some of the schools. But the, the, the real um, help that we need though is making connections, you know? And so, you know, I think there's, there's you know, 80, 90 people online right now, you know, helping connect with, you know, high school guidance counselors, teachers who might be able to influence those students um, you know, to think about Embry Riddle as an option, uh, it's not for a lack of trying. I'll share that with you. I think our recruitment offices go out of their way to try to help, but um, you know, trying to help us with getting those connections would be very valuable. Um, I know the Gates Aerospace Institute that reaches out into high schools right now in Florida is is um, has a pretty significant um, number of touch points throughout the state. But at the end of the day, we have to close the deal, and that is, you know, getting the students to come. So, you know, I think the message right now is, my gosh, what an incredible opportunities that are out there. I know we're in a kind of a downturn right now in the industry, but it'll it'll rebound pretty quickly, and and the opportunities are out there. And I think that's the message. And anything you and others can do through your connections uh, to help the recruiting offices get in touch with the in, I'll call them the influencers. You know, it's one thing, not necessarily the students, but the people who influence them, their teachers, their guidance counselors, 
uh, community leaders, you know, in, in their communities would be helpful. So please reach out to um, uh, either, either uh, BJ in Daytona Beach or uh, Brian Doherty out in Prescott to say, hey, here's a, here's a name of someone that can influence a few people in this community. Um, I think all of us pushing hard together will, will make it work. So thank you for your comment. Thank you, Dr. Butler. All right, Felina, you are next. Okay, so um, one thing that I learned um, in the past couple of weeks, so because of this movement, this spurred a lot of um, conversation across the world, especially in Trinidad. And one thing that I, you know, always thought was that racism was always blatant. And it forced me to look into myself and see, you know, things that I learned, um, you know, growing up in a certain type of society and the prejudices that comes with it that that may be little that that you you it's not blatant and one thing that i really learned you know over the past couple of weeks is to to look inside myself um and to to recognize and to accept that these are things that i learned um and that i can unlearn them um one one thing is that i i saw a lot in Trinidad um, was colorism, um, things that, you know, people of just a darker skin color, they would be looked over for jobs, positions, just, just anything. And something, it was something that I had to, to see happening um, that I really didn't think was there. And because of all of this, you know, I, I had to accept things and and talk to my family about it as well, um, because it was just things that that we didn't see at all. And so I, I'm really happy um, that because of this movement, it's spurring a lot of conversation now. So thank you guys for talking about this as well. Absolutely, thanks for your input. All right, um, we had one that raise their hand physically through the video. Uh, Got to find you real quick on the side, Vanessa. Hold on one moment. All right, you're unmuted, go ahead. Okay, um, so kind of picking up from what Felina just shared, um, it's purely anecdotal and this has been my experience when having conversations with people regarding this issue is how much self-awareness is key I mean, in the aviation community, we talk about having situational awareness. Do you ever stop to look at the society that you're in or the community that you're in and ask yourself why? Because as citizens of the globe, it's you, there's no such thing as a neutral player. Your lack of knowledge or your lack of awareness is not an excuse. Your lack of awareness has an impact somewhere else. It may not necessarily impact you, but it impacts somebody else. So just because you don't know, it's not, it's not okay to know, to not know and exist in that um, area of not knowing. So my discussions um, on social media through friends is just being struck by how often people are like, oh, I didn't know, you know, I come from Kenya and I never had to think of myself as black up until I came into um, the US, it was like, oh, I mean, I know I'm black, I know I'm black, but I never had to confront my racial identity, so to speak, up until I got into this country. And being confronted with that, I had to educate myself on a, a number of issues. So educating myself in that way and understanding what my role is in society, I think was absolutely critical in understanding, you know, America, why is America the way it is today? And so I'd put it out there that it's not many, I don't know if any of you are aware with the safety community and we have the five whys. So when an incident occurs, we always would like to do an analysis and we ask ourselves why, and not just the first why, don't stop at that first why, keep asking yourself why up until you get to the root cause. And that analysis, not too many people take the time to ask themselves why when it comes to their environment, you know, it's, you're, 
carrying on and but not really stopping to pause and ask yourself why why is it the way that it is or why is, isn't it in a certain way so yeah i just like to mention self-awareness and asking yourself those five whys as well that's a great perspective thank you Natalie, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, so something that, you know, Felina got me thinking about and Vanessa kind of hit on was the whole idea of, uh, you know, stopping and pausing and taking a breath. Um, for those of you that know me and those of you that don't know me, I'm a very loud person. I don't struggle voicing my opinion. I'm very blunt sometimes to a fault. Um, and when all of this first started happening, and even with other issues like sexism, um, I'm very loud, I'm very brash. I call people out when I don't see them commenting on it or you know, telling somebody like what they're talking about is wrong. And one of my friends who's a fellow ERAU alumni had a post on Facebook that kind of made me stop and think where she was talking about not everybody has the words. It's great if you have the words, it's great if you're able to directly talk about it or if you're able to stand up. But a lot of people right now are, you know, like Felina kind of alluded to being, you know, faced with situations and ideas that they've never had to come into effect with. And so I just would like to remind everybody and, you know, kind of remind myself at the same time that when you see people being silent on social media or you haven't seen a company, let's say, necessarily talk about it yet, it's very possible that they are not aware of what the right words are and that we should try to be patient with people as they kind of try to overcome some of these ideals and these um, systemic issues that they've never had to face before. All right. Thank you, Natalie. So that actually kind of transitions and since I don't see any more hands up um, into an image that I saw this week that I'm very, very curious um, about some thoughts on. So I'm going to share my screen here for a moment and then we'll, we'll chat about this. So this was something I saw uh, that I found extremely interesting as Natalie just described about people not knowing the right words. Even deeper than that, sometimes people don't know how to feel as far as what's going on right now. Um, as you can see, there are a few quadrants here and it says right in the middle, it's okay to be here, that you have what you might consider your values, your identities intersecting and overlapping and sometimes in conflict um, at certain times. And so it's, it's, very, it's a very confusing time. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing that one now. I think y'all have all had a chance to read it. So I'm curious as to y'all's thoughts, um, if there were some more circles on there, what are some of the things that you think might be coming into conflict with what you're seeing and what you're feeling around the world right now? Right. Jamaria, go ahead. Should be unmuted. Here you go. All right. Um, so I've been seeing that picture a lot too. Um, and I do not condone looting or burning anything, but I think a lot of people need to understand why this is ha like stuff like that's happening. Cause a lot of people jump straight to, oh, they're looting, oh, they're burning stuff. They're equally as bad as the cop who killed them. And it's like, not really. You have to understand that a lot of the things that they are burning, they're either burning it because um, it has some systematic, like identity still in it. Like when they knock over the Robert E. Lee statue when they paint over stuff like old confederate statues like they're doing that because they want they want to bring attention that this is isn't something we should still idolize here like because a lot of those statues are they hurt to see like i live in south carolina so the confederate flag the confederate everything plantation houses all that stuff is always around and like i've never been able to avoid any of that in my life and it still hurts to see it because when you read it it's like god bless these confederate soldiers and it's just like why are we still congratulating them like they lost the war and usually when you lose a war like how i feel about a lot of this stuff is like if how i related it to a friend was like if germany kept all of their uh, nazi statues and nazi flags and stuff up after they lost 
like even when you like when you see the swastika now it hurts your feelings you're just like why do people do that that's how a lot of black people feel when they see the confederate flag and confederate statues because it's just like you're still condoning or you're still worshiping this system that wanted to enslave people with a darker skin tone and um it, like, it might not even be that it just might be people don't realize like that there's pain behind when we see a lot of that stuff and um i think when it comes to a lot of the looting and the rioting and all that stuff like i do not i'm not here for it like i would never do it i wish people wouldn't do it but you have to still understand why people are doing it and a lot of people just jump to the conclusion like oh they're looting they're evil they're just doing it because they want to I don't think anybody, I mean, there are some people that wake up and be like, I want to burn the world, but then there, most of the pe pro people who are protesting are actually very peaceful, and they, like, just want to walk and pe be noticed, and then there are those other ones who burn down stores and buildings and all other stuff, so I think everybody, like, you just need to realize, like, all the angles to it instead of just looking at it, like, Bl like just blank what it is because before a lot of this race stuff happened most people weren't doing this like it wasn't it wasn't a common thing like people weren't just going out looting stores and burning things just because something happened that triggered people as it should have and they that was their reaction to it because they didn't because peaceful didn't get america's attention and when it did they changed the narrative to make it seem like we were disrespecting america so i mean it's like it's a big gray area of how to feel like i understand feeling looting and stuff is wrong because i feel it's wrong too but i still there's like there's a reason why they're doing it That's all. Uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that i'm curious what anyone else uh thinks or feels about where where they might be intersecting in some of those spots Oh, Vanessa, you're raising your hand again. Okay, go for it. Um, from what I have seen with my discussions and some people call me a social justice warrior on social media or whatever, a lot of my discussions um, with people who hold that stance that, you know, it's, it's not okay to loot from, a lot of times it's almost like a conversation uh, deflector from what the root cause. And I say it's it's absolutely okay to hold the opinion that it's, you know, you shouldn't be looting, you shouldn't be burning. But I also think it's disingenuous to hyper focus on the looting and the burning if you have not given the same type of energy to the root cause. Um, because if you are incredibly upset that you know the these corporations the, they're burning down businesses they're burning down um or stealing whatever it is i say oh, yes it's absolutely tragic you can condone something but you can also understand why something is happening you know if you i think the main thing would be to humanize the people who are out there burning and looting i'm not saying that there are certain people who will not take advantage of the situation and try to loot or burn or you know just be i don't know criminal in their behavior for the sake of it but to the larger extent humanize the people who are there and you know when you look at um not to infantilize the movement but if you see a child having a temper tantrum um a lot of times it's you've gotten to a point where you feel like you don't have the language and to deal with a tantrum you empower that person to give them the language you know parents almost always tell their kids you know use your words and these are adults who've gotten to the point where they're burning stuff down it's not a normal reaction for any human to want to burn their environment and by the time it's gotten there this should be analyzed as an extreme reaction to something so hyper focusing on that extreme reaction and condemning it i think is morally disingenuous if you have not taken the time to again the five whys of analyzing why it has gotten to that point if you take the time to understand okay you're looting this is not normal for any human being to be looting and burning and doing um stuff that i think would be uh destroying their community then you trace it back to why would they be doing this? And then it becomes very understandable as to why it has gotten to this point. So it's not fair to just 
analyze the situation as though it occurred in a vacuum. It's not an isolated event. It's not something that, these are not aliens who were dropped out of nowhere and decided to start burning and looting stuff. These are members of our society. So it has to be addressed as if it occurred in a continuum. What has gotten us to this point and, and analyzing it logically in that way. That's a good thought. So you, you had used, actually, so I'll, I'll get to you one second, Daniel. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and do you now, and then uh, we'll continue with the other thought. All right, you should be unmuted. Okay, I guess since we're going for tangible solutions, uh, I guess a follow-up comment, I guess, on what Professor Butler, I mean, President Butler said. Um, the, an outreach to communities of color, honestly, uh, I guess not having an influence in communities of color is a thing. I mean, it makes sense uh, that everybody's in touch with every single type of community, but making an actual effort to go out there and actually seeing these students and other, introducing them to the aviation community. But uh, I'll, that's just one final thought that I had on that. As for, um, I heard issues like colorism brought up, the rioting and the looting. Um, and last, uh, fall semester at the Daytona Beach campus, there was a diversity and inclusion uh, training done by a speaker by the name of Raven Solomon that I went to that was actually quite informative. Um, maybe kind of incorporating diversity and inclusion as a, in a form of uh, training to the students. Um, I'm not saying it needs to be mandatory, but just exposing people to the fact that the world that they, the, the world that they see on our campus, it doesn't reflect all the colors and everybody that there is out there. Um, I guess that's a tangible kind of solution, just introducing students to di more diversity and inclusion training, because you can offer it, but I guess, how do you get people to attend? Um, just because, like I said, I went to that speaker's uh, training and there was like 10, 15 people there tops. Um, on a campus with thousands of students. Yeah, and that's some of those conversations are actually already taking place right now for increased programming for, you know, diversity and inclusion. And so thank you again for sharing that perspective. Um, all right, Rebecca, go ahead. Uh, this is uh, to everyone and also Daniel, we actually were having a conversation, we had a meeting for diversity, equity and inclusion today and we talked about how we could improve, you know, that dialogue in the school and how it really starts from the freshmen coming in and um, we're working on trying to fix the curriculum for University 101. Um, Nagar, the person who you're sending all your messages to, if you're sending those, she, you know, she taught a class, or BA 201, and she required students to go and listen to these speeches, and, you know, that is a really good idea, and it seems like you had learned a lot from that, and I think having, a, like, more keynote speakers, having required attendance is definitely going to be something, but I did want to let you guys know that that is something that is happening, and um, we are working on that as best as we can, but every, like everything, it does take time. Awesome. And so Vanessa, I want to key in on a word that you used uh, was humanize. Um, so a big focus of this conversation is, you know, we talked about that we wanted to discuss shared humanity. Um, so what are things that, that some of y'all have experienced, uh, most specifically Embry-Riddle community, that gives you hope that we can come together and be successful in something like this. Some of the bonds that you have shared with people who may not look like you, who may not have the same background. Um, we'd love to hear some of those positive experiences as we begin to move forward in this conversation. Am I good to go? Or? Oh yeah, I, yeah, it seems that you are unmuted. Um, go ahead. Uh, I'll share it as, a member of uh, the African Students Association, if anyone knows one thing is food pe brings people together. And um, it's the, one of the easiest ways to bond with people is food. And one of the moment, one of the few moments that kept touching me is seeing um, members of the Riddle community who um, 
are white or non-black or non-African who would come through and actually be genuinely curious, you know, not just, even if they didn't have the money to buy food on that day, there are few members of the Riddle community who would stop and actually take a genuine interest, you know, where is this from? Um, you know, what is it exactly? Where are you from? And they would take the time to ask those questions. So I think having that genuine curiosity and need wanting to learn about somebody else, you know, that it's not just passing by the tent and seeing people as, oh, those are the African students, you know, that's their thing, but seeing certain members who look at themselves as actual members of the Riddle community and who want to interact with other groups. So that was good. I'm glad to hear that. So that they were, again, kind of celebrating some of the things that made the African Students Association um, different, you know, like the different background, the different culture, the different food, like it was lifted up in a celebration and, and an experience. And that is so cool to see. Um, so we got two other hands up right now, Natalie, then Jamaria. All right, Natalie, you should be unmuted now. Yeah, yeah so uh, my kind of goes along with what Vanessa was actually saying. So I know this year um, the Black Students Association did a full week long of activities. And I think one of the coolest moments for me was they did the parade of flags. And I was a little worried, you know, sitting in the student union about what comments I might hear that they might like students around me might say, oh, this is stupid. Like, I don't get what's going on. You know, the drums are really loud or whatever. And I was really, really <laughs> thrilled to see that a lot of people instead of asking questions, oh, that flag is really cool. You know, what country is that from? Or, hey, that kid's in my class. Like, I didn't know he represented this country. I'll have to ask him some cool things. Like, there was just... I was surrounded all of a sudden by questions and comments that were all positive. You know, the student union is a very big place <laughs> and you get surrounded by a lot of people really quickly. And it was really cool just to hear all these questions and people genuinely interested. They weren't downplaying what the activity was. They didn't, you know, put it off as silly or annoying. They were genuinely interested and wanted to know more. And I thought that was really inspiring for me because I feel like sometimes uh, some of the other verbiage I hear on campus can be a little concerning. Uh, so I was a little worried about the event, but just hearing all of the amazing comments really, you know, made me pause and go, okay, I, I feel a little bit better about, you know, the community I'm a part of. And I think this is going to start a lot of really great conversation. Awesome. All right. Go ahead, Jamir. Maybe. I there clicked on. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so a few experiences. Um, I don't know how many of you know about the diversity and inclusion office. Uh, us, 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 folk that like to chill in there call it the hub. Um, being in there, um, and now since it's much with the honors kids, uh, it is really like been an interesting combination of like cultures because like sometimes they ask questions especially when the um either caribbean students or african students come in and start doing stuff with their flags or whatever they'll ask questions um about some stuff uh when we have the um when bsa holds the black alumni panel um we have some people who are interested in coming to that and ask questions about um stuff and the black experience um to some of the alumni um which i find really fascinating um, because I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, and then, uh, activities fair day, um, when I was the president of the Black Student Association, like a year or so ago, um, that we have a lot of kids come up to our tent and ask questions about, like, about, like, what it was like growing up, uh, in America, uh, as a Black person. Um, we had people asking, like, of non- non-black people asking if they could join so they could learn more and be a part of the discussion. We had some like interesting um, stuff like that uh, happen. So, I mean, it's been pretty cool and uh, introducing a lot of different cultures to like the things that people think are exclusively for colored folk um, on campus um, has been pretty, has been pretty dope because a lot of people don't know about Nesby and know that everybody can join it or OBAP and that everybody can join it. 
um stuff like that so it's been it's been a really cool experience uh with some people who actually are like actively trying to figure out more about um the black community and stuff that is so cool that that again these organizations that that have their roots in again celebrating uh persons of color black people are so open and welcoming and again sharing that human aspect of the riddle or the engineering or the aviation experience with anyone who wants to join like that is that is a perfect combination of the two that's so cool um all right matemi you should be unmuted now matemi all right i can see you you're you can if you want to talk. All right. Um, I'm going to lower your hand on here and mute you. Uh, if you want to try again in a few minutes, we'll just raise your hand again uh, once your, your mic might be working. All right. Felina. Um, I just wanted to um, address the question in the chat. Um, has anyone ever thought that labeling associations with race actually brings a society apart instead of bringing them together? So as a member of the Caribbean Students Association, um, Black Students Association, African Students Association, um, OBAP, Nesby, I think it's a beautiful thing that I could go to any of these clubs and find out about these specific cultures. I think the main aim of these groups is to inform, you know, um, the and riddle community about our culture and what it means to us and how we you know how we bring things um to to the community itself um i think that because of these clubs we create meaningful discussions and we bring um, more people together by information informing the community about what we do um, about our culture and how we can learn and grow together. Um, and that's really the main aim of these cultural organizations. And I think they're a huge part of the Ember Riddle culture. Thanks. Thank you for those thoughts. All right. Go ahead, Natalie. Yeah, so I, funny enough, Lena, I also wanted to address the comment. Um, so, you know, first of all, I kind of want to take out the word race real quick. And the reason is because nobody truly thinks twice when it's something like the Society of Women Engineers, which I led. Mm -hmm. A lot of these organizations give people a common area to talk to people that have shared their experiences and have gone through things that they have, which is what Felina was just talking about. Um, and as somebody that works for student organizations, I just want to remind everybody that just because it's the organization of black aerospace professionals or the black students association, you know, being a member to those organizations is open to everybody. If you're genuinely interested in trying to, you know, join an aerospace professional community, OBAP is amazingly welcoming and you are not allowed to be denied membership purely because you are not black. So, you know, keep that in mind that these organizations are open to everybody. If you're genuinely interested in something, go talk to them. I have never had a negative experience with an organization on Embry-Riddle's campus, which is why I work so hard alongside Nagar and the other amazing people of Sisu with organizations, you know, is these organizations are amazing. They will welcome you with open arms. They will talk to you all day, every day about whatever you could bring to them. So keep that in mind as well with some of these organizations. Thanks, Natalie. All right, Matemi, we're gonna give you another shot here. Let's see if it works. Can you all hear me now? We can hear you now, wonderful, go ahead. Perfect, sorry about that earlier. Um, just regarding to the comments that you added, what positive experiences we have seen that kind of gives us hope at the Embry-Riddle community. Um, as the previous president of the African Student Association, I'll touch on a couple of events that I think showed me hope. Uh, one of them was the last event that we held, one of the bigger events was coming to Africa and witnessing a lot of people from different cultures, different backgrounds coming together and 
interested in learning about the different cultures that exist. Um, and overall, the unity of the different Black organizations that we have on campus, on top of the administration's efforts to kind of uh, understand and learn about new, new things as well. Those are the, some of the things that kind of keep me hopeful. And uh, just like Natalie touched on and uh, Vanessa as well as Jamaria, I think the interest has to come from the individual first um, to learn about different cultures, different um, organizations or different types of activities that are on school because they are there to some extent. Um, they might not be well um, advertised or well seen across for different students, but they are there. And promoting these uh, different student um, initiatives, I think would be uh, pretty good to promote the, the diversity and inclusion on our campus. Absolutely. Thanks. Jamaria, you're up. Hi. Hi again. I also wanted to address the comment <laughs> that was made. Um, so when it comes to race on campus, I do think that we should still continue to recognize it because when we say things like um, that bring that bring attention to our race, we don't want you to ignore it and become colorblind to our culture or our skin tone simply because it makes us different. Simple fact, I'm like when I'm when I'm black, I'm born black. That's the first thing you see when you see me, you see my skin tone and then you see I'm a woman and then you see everything else. So um, a lot of these clubs, um, as also mentioned in the comments, Embry-Riddle is a PWI, which means predominantly white institution. And going to one of those um, as a black person, it feels it can feel isolating, especially if there's not a club for you and being Caribbean. If there's not a club for you, you feel isolated. And being African, if there's not a club for you, you also feel isolated. Because like, like we aren't trying to kick other people out of our clubs or trying to have a social group where it's just us. We just want to have a space where we can see that, that hey, there's people like me here. Um, I think everybody should be able to look in the room and be like, hey, there's another person like me here. And being Black at Riddle, you don't necessarily get that. A lot of the times in these engineering classes, I'm the only Black female in there. Like, and like, I might not be the only female, but I might be the only Black person in there. And I think um, ignoring race um, isn't, isn't going to separate us more. Because, um, I mean, if, if you feel like, uh, like uh, race uh, deters you or mentioning race deters you from um, coming to a group, I think you should investigate those groups and like go talk to somebody who's a part of them and actually get to discover the culture and figure out that, hey, we're not trying to kick you out. We'd actually love it if you come and educate yourself on the stuff. It's um, just, I think everybody should still recognize because I don't want you to not see my color. Thank you for sharing that. And that's, that's something I've been trying to figure out for a very long time. Um, I have a, a wonderful friend who has told me when I go out into the world and I apply for jobs, I just want to be seen as me, you know, um, but I also want to be seen as a proud black man of who I am and everything that comes along with that uh, because it's a deep and rich history. And so again, kind of this, this whole conversation celebrating our differences and recognizing that they do exist and they are important but under the umbrella of our shared humanity like that's where that needs to be recognized and that's it's critical uh miguel i can see that your hand is up like this so i'm going to go ahead and call on you so you can uh you can rest let me unmute you here go ahead hi yes hi everybody um yeah i just wanted to add um regarding uh what everybody was saying before um, like all these organizations that we have on campus, uh, they also provide a, a very important safe space to all these communities, uh, whatever the community is. So, uh, I mean, if, if you're part of a community, of course, we've been talking about like people gravitate towards these organizations because they want to see, like, they want to be with people that pertain, like are part of their community as well. Um, but I, I, I want to highlight the importance of uh, allyship as well. Um, like for instance, I don't know if everybody knows, but um, I'm, 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 I lead one of the um, LGBTQ plus organizations on campus, and uh, it's we don't get a lot of um, people that are not part of our community into uh, our organization. So, um, like we, 
our organization is open to, to everybody, uh, whether they're part of the LGBTQ plus community or not. And that's, that's very important. Um, and as we've been saying before, like we're all part of this, the same world, like we're all, um, yeah, we're all citizens of, the, uh, citizens of this world. So it's, I don't know, it's just, it's just important to like lend a hand and be, be allies towards each other. Thanks, Miguel. Um, all right, so we got three hands raised right now, Vanessa, Taryn, and Kirsten. Uh, Vanessa, yours was up first, so we'll go with you. Go for it. Okay. Um, so just to answer the question um, about race perhaps being divisive, I was going to say that race is an independent factor separate of anything, you know, societal. It's, it's pretty neutral. You know, I'm black, you're white. So it's not divisive in itself. It's our presumptions, our prejudices, and um, everything else that comes around with our society. There's nothing divisive about my existence. You exist in your blackness, your whiteness. There's nothing absolutely divisive in your um, existence. You're a human being. So, um, and you should see me, you know, you should see me as a black person because you should see me as a Kenyan. You may not know I'm Kenyan, but if you're black and perhaps you hear my accent for some of those who know, they'll be like, oh, you have a British accent, but you should see me and all my nuances and um, respect that, that something has gone into this individual and don't erase any part of it as I would never want to erase any part of somebody who is white, Asian or, you know, of any other race. So it should be celebrated as Sean has said several times here that our differences should be celebrated and not looked at as um, a negative factor. Oftentimes when you hear that statement being made, it's for people who would, um, I call them the ostriches, you'd like to bury your head in the sand, you know, and just the ra racism does not exist. This, this does not happen. Uh, or, you know, race is a negative thing because of racism, but it's not negative. It's the ideas we have around race that makes racism exist. So if we tried to actually address our ideas of race and educate ourselves about the ideas we have about race, then we start to eradicate racism. Um, and into that idea of eradicating race completely is colorblindness politics is erasure politics, I like to call it. You can't erase somebody's history or somebody's existence. And the other thing as um, Miguel touched on is needing of safe spaces. Um, in my discourse with different people about, you know, like the BLM movement or um, like having the hub being predominantly black, we've seen those instances where somebody comes in and there are a bunch of black people in the hub and there's this quick take back like, oh, have I walked into the wrong place? And um, it's as an African um, coming here, you, the, when you're the minority in a certain environment, you absolutely need that safe space. You know, I don't know if any of you have had the experience of traveling outside the US and going to a country where you perhaps don't speak the language. It's always a comforting factor to go somewhere where, you know, somebody speaks English. It has nothing to do with you hating that region or it's just searching for that commonality with somebody else that gives you some type of comfort and bolsters you to be able to maneuver that environment. Because that safe space, I, our system does not have anything to do with GPA. And as a past president of ASA, seeing how us taking in those African kids and breaking down the system to them, explaining to them, how, you know, this is what GPA is. This is why it's incredibly critical to you to understand why this 4.0 means something. You know, AMS, we have a seven point grading system. It's not the same as a 10 point grading system. So there are certain aspects that somebody who's a majority in this country will take for granted, whereas somebody who's transferring here will not, you know, it may be completely simple to you, like, oh, you know, we you're not able to rent a car if you're um, below 25 or there's just certain things about existing in the system that others may take for granted that um, immigrant students may not necessarily know or international students may not necessarily know. So it's incredibly important for us to have those safe spaces where we can maneuver this PWIs, as Jamaria puts it, to be able to succeed. So it's not in any way, um, an ex 
an attempt at excluding others, but it's more of an attempt of um, lifting those of us who are other in this um, community. Thanks, Vanessa. All right, Taryn. Hi, can everyone hear me? We got you. Okay, so I don't wanna take up too much time because I'm a faculty member and I wanna give space to students, but I did kind of want to amplify a little bit what Vanessa and others were saying. You know, I'm a Latina faculty member who's obviously fairly white passing, as you can see. And, um, but for me, you know, I dropped out of high school, got a GED. Um, I was told over and over again, I didn't belong. My high school was heavily policed. That's part of why I dropped out. And, um, you know, throughout the whole process of obtaining a PhD, I was continually told I didn't belong for different cultural markers and things like that. And I would not have made it through my degrees without safe spaces like Latino student organizations and other organizations for people of color. I think they're so, so important. Um, and I do think too, like to add to that from sort of a faculty perspective, but this also comes from when I was a student, it's also so important in the classroom to get ethnic studies education as an option, um, especially because in this country in particular, you don't get a lot of the histories of non-white peoples in high schools. And so college is really the only place for that. Um, and so I know like, similar to the comment that was made in the chat about, you know, is it maybe divisive to have groups that focus on race and ethnicity, people will make the same argument about like my field of study, which is um, US Latino studies, and they'll say, well, but isn't that exclusionary? And I mean, that's kind of the point, right? Because there are no spaces in like US American studies for US Latinos to write about um, and be talked about. There has to be like, the, until they can be included, until we can be included in those bigger groups in a, um, equitable way, those safe spaces have to be there. And so I just wanted to say thanks to all the students who are talking about that because I know it's hard and I think you're putting yourselves in vulnerable positions and it's brave of you to do it. Great points. Um, all right, we have time for one more before we're gonna roll kind of into our, our action part of this. Uh, McCormick, you should be unmuted. Again, I clicked it, I swear. All right, can you hear me now? Gotcha. Okay, I'm trying to build on what Vanessa was saying. And what really came to mind about being a student from, you know, an African country and how, you know, like Vanessa, you said, yeah, I know I'm black, but it's like all of a sudden you're here in America and it's like, you are black, you know? It's like, <laughs> so imagine if you are a student from Kenya coming to Embry-Riddle and part of your orientation and you're a black male student coming is what you should do if you are pulled over by the police. Imagine that your international students that are, you know, of a, a visibly black, you know, a person of color. That is something that they should know about the United States of America. And imagine that's not something that we do with our white sons. And I think that in terms of safe spaces, it is so necessary because you, you want to know that you can have those real conversations to be able to inform each other. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of rambling. I don't know, everything's kind of like triggering a lot of emotions in me, so. Thank no, no, that's okay. We talked earlier about there's a lot of conflicting feelings and a lot of heavy things. Um, so thank you for being willing to even engage in the conversation with all that. Um, so what's about to, uh, Kirsten, yes, your hand was up before and you had kind of disappeared. So I'm gonna give you one chance here real quick. Okay, thank you. Um, my name's Kirsten. I am also a white Latina. And so I'm um, understanding a lot of what uh, Taryn, I believe is how you pronounced it, is talking about. Um, I'm coming from another predominantly white institution. I worked at Oregon State University um, and at UCF, not as um, predominantly white, but uh, at, at Oregon State, um, one of the things that we really came to recognize after um, 
having a student speak out um, about uh, a speak out holding the administration accountable was that the student groups are great. They're wonderful. They're necessary. Um, it, it, it needs to be the faculty, the staff who are attending these trainings, who are understanding um, all of these things that are being experienced by these students, not just students of color, but faculty and staff of color as well. And so, I, you know, maybe as you go into the action piece, I think you said was next, maybe that's something to discuss because if the if the students of color are not seeing staff of color, if they're not seeing faculty of color, um, or at least people who are informed and aware, then the, the, the whole picture, it's not a complete picture. It's not, um, it's, it's you, otherwise you have students who are supporting students, but the big picture of, of people being of the students being supported and the actual community members, faculty and staff being supported as well is missing. So, thank you. Absolutely, and that is a perfect point and actually the perfect transition into what I was about to say. Um, on my screen alone, we, it says we have 93 participants. I see two deans, I see President Butler, um, I see the provost, and I know on the other screens we have representatives from athletics, um, we have folks from ROTC, other university admin and, and college leadership, which is very, very encouraging that so many folks took the time this evening to come in um, and engage, not just with students, not just with staff, but as an Embry-Riddle community. That is so cool. So thank you all again for, for that. Um, so what we're going to do right now, um, we'll split into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to put it as about 10 people per room and we're just going to do it for 10 minutes and I encourage the conversation. You don't have to spend, please don't spend 10 minutes on introductions, um, but this is a chance to talk about action steps. What are some things that we as Embry-Riddle can do to improve and move forward, whether that's kind of in a long run, such as establishing certain types of classes or curricula or something in the short term, um, things that you can do you know, reaching out to certain groups, reaching out to certain friends, um, supporting local businesses in the area that may be owned by persons of color or immigrants or something like that. Um, you know, LGBTQ experiences, like all of these types of things, um, what actions can we take moving forward? So we'll break out here real quick. And then in 10 minutes, we'll call everyone back. We're not gonna be able to discuss everything that comes from every group. Um, I'm recognizing again, we're, we're at 6.05, we're ending at 6.30. But what uh, I encourage y'all to do after we come back into this main session is send the moderators, again, Nagar Afshar, who she's under, please submit your comments here, or Jessica Murphy, um, put your email address. If you'd like to receive that whole list, if you'd like to see a copy of this chat later, we can put that and we can bring people together to continue having these types of conversations in the future. So uh, give me one second and I'll set this up for, for splitting up for a quick conversation. Welcome back everyone. Um, appreciate y'all taking some time to, to chat, you know, between yourselves, hopefully you had some more in-depth conversation than you might be able to arrange in, uh, you know, this large group here. So it seems we lost about 15 people um, between the last 10 minutes, but that's cool those who really want to be here are sticking around. So thanks for doing so. Um, so with our last like 12, 13 minutes, just want to hear a couple of thoughts from representatives from each of y'all's groups. Um, what are some things that we should keep in mind? What are some things we should take uh, steps towards as we move forward to help ERAU become a really awesome community? Um, so let's see those. Oh, we've already got a hand up. Eric Watkins. Let's make it happen. Hey, hey, um, Eric Watkins from Student Engagement, Daytona Beach Campus. Um, one thing that we definitely did touch upon was making sure that we get that student feedback. And we were lucky enough to have a, um, a student um, veteran in our group as well. So making sure that um, we touch upon some of the groups that we might, you know, forget or um, 
not really, you know, remember or might be uh, secondhand, but making sure that we touch upon getting feedback from all of our student groups. Um, I was just telling the group that um, I do our social media and anytime we pose a question on our storyboard on Instagram, you know, students are quick to give you feedback, um, you know, left field comments and suggestions, but, um, you know, they these suggestions come from a meaningful place. So making sure that even though we can kind of set the groundwork um, for different options or opportunities students can um, kind of definitely take um, or participate in activities, but making sure that when we give them suggestions, making sure that we get that feedback from them and using that feedback. Um, lastly, um, one of the activities we thought would definitely be useful is um, now that we're engaging in these social distance practices, um, creating maybe a, a speaker series. So um, I know we have the aviation outlook. So maybe creating a, a separate speaker series for um, a conversation such as this. Awesome, thanks, Eric. All right, uh, Natalie, you're up. Yeah, so something that um, our breakout room discussed um, was a lot of universities and companies right now are being challenged to release their DNI numbers. Um, how many POCs they have, how many women they have, what percentage of their board is white. And we talked about the university, you know, already has that information, um, you know, through institutional research and human resources, but it's very, very hard to find. Um, so the university kind of pushing it out to the entire community and being really, really blunt about, hey, here's what our upper administration looks like. Here's what, you know, per campus it looks like, things like that. And Dr. Oswalt, uh, you know, brought up, well, then what do we do with this? You know, um, kind of where do we go from there? And something that was brought up was, um, you know, the idea of looking at the numbers and seeing, okay, well, what communities are we not reaching out to? What communities are we struggling with? And then making actionable goals and a plan to reach out to those communities. And then additionally, you know, this kind of feeds into what Eric was talking about, right? Storytelling, you know, talking about the organizations and the groups here that are already, you know, you know, BSA, ASA, you know, um, CCSA, and really promoting these ways that Embry-Riddle is already diverse, but not just, you know, oh, we always hear about these, you know, 10 organizations, but really making sure we're showing everybody. It's not just our organizations that are diverse, you know, we have a U.S. Uh, Latin American class now and a minor and really pr trying to promote what, how we currently are diverse and start building up that trust in both the general public and the ERU community about what we're currently doing and what we're planning to do. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, let's see, uh, Vanessa. Uh, okay, so for our group, um, we came up with the fact that we can bring social um, injustice issues to campus through films, the same way we used to host um, movie night and tell people to, you know, come watch. What's this a super popular one? I forget, but we used to host movie night. So if uh, it's possible to have movies on race and other social injustice issues, bring them to the classroom. Uh, not walk away from this discussion about race, especially in the arts and everything. Uh, Dean Gaines, I'm sorry, I didn't bring that up when we were talking about this. But um, bring it to the classroom, you know, these books that have been banned in um, certain communities or certain curriculum, just have these books brought back into the arts curricula and um, have these conversations, which, you know, and a lot of times it seems taboo to discuss race, but I mean, it's here, it's not going anywhere. And if you don't talk about it, it's just going to keep manifesting itself in pretty negative ways. So if we cannot bring it to the university level where we can um, have it in terms of film, podcasts or books, in our curriculum then and you know be able to hold conversations where the professor can have control over them and you know and try to direct them in a genuine way then um, i think that would be a great way to bring that back you know like ask ourselves what's our percentage of um 
you know, Latinx authors or African authors or black authors in the curricula and um, address that in that way. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, McCormick. Thank you. I don't know about you all, but that was a really quick 10 minutes. It went by very quickly. Yeah. But two good points in our breakout. One was that Ken stated that it'd be very powerful to have collaboration amongst all the student organizations. And in my experience, that's very true. One of the things that I did in my role in the FAA was I met regularly as a group with all the presidents of the employee associations in the Federal Aviation Administration. And because they can talk as one voice in a group like that, it wielded a tremendous amount of power. And it led to more and more collaboration between the various student organizations that built a momentum that didn't go away. The other suggestion in the group from Brandon was that our faculty needs to better represent the makeup of our community. Our faculty is predominantly white. Our faculty is still predominantly male. And that needs to change because if we're going to have an environment that is inclusive, we need to live it. And Brandon brought that up, that, that, would help, that would help him so much as a student if he could look across the faculty and see the same thing. One of the things that I'm taking away from this is a gentleman by the name of Oscar Holmes. I'd like to call Oscar Holmes to Jackie Robinson of air traffic control. He broke the color barrier in 1942 and he continued on to become a very successful person not just in air traffic control, but in the Federal Aviation Administration and retired at a high level in FAA headquarters. I am going to now advocate that at least one of the air traffic control labs is going to be named after him. There is a legacy out there that is unknown and there is a vision that is unmet. And I would like to do anything I can to rectify that. So that's our breakout. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And he mentioned it was a quick 10 minutes. Um, yeah, we, we weren't anticipating to solve all the world's problems in this, but we did want to have at least some more intimate conversation. Uh, got two more hands up and then we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll close out the meeting after y'all. Uh, Jamaria, you are up. All right, hi. Um, so in our breakout session, uh, we basically discussed um, having a faculty training, a uh, racism training, and um, basically how that might uh, have both positive and negative effects on campus. Uh, and I don't mean negative, like, hey, might be, it might, it can be used, like their training can be used as an excuse to maybe ignore the fact that they might've said something offensive. But, um, and then we also discussed uh, better planning uh, among, with, well, better coordination um, with events in these diverse communities with the faculty um, and with uh, programs that they align with, like with the Black Alumni Panel as um, coming to uh, career services and being like, hey, we're holding this event that might be helpful to students get jobs, stuff like that. And um, so that everybody on campus will be more knowledgeable about um, events and things that are happening so we can display the diversity that we do have on campus because a lot of the times uh, it's been noticed that um, when we do have events they aren't blasted and only the people who are in those communities come to those events which is something that we were discussing that needs to be different gotcha thank you uh, Rebecca, go ahead. Uh, Natalie actually spoke for our group, but I just did 
want to say one quick thing. Um, I'm the ambassador, the student ambassador for the wellness committee, and I sent my email down in the chat. It's pretty simple if you forget it. It's just mer. It's like the easiest uh -huh. ERU email you'll ever see in your life. But um, if you are interested in like bettering the mental health of our community and also the diversity and inclusion, if that's something that is like on your mind all the time, or you want to help build our students and like our community, please send me an email because I would love to start a committee. Um, of just students and so we can work with like faculty and staff and just like seeing a change in our community um yeah and i just also wanted to thank everyone for coming today like it was so awesome to have like 100 people here and i honestly like i i hope for the best but worse and i think i was pleasantly surprised so thank you <laughs> yeah absolutely um, so again there, there are just a couple more hands that have popped up i, I want to give them the opportunity uh to speak so let's uh, let's hear what you got, Mr. Tom. Maybe there we go. All right. So uh, I just think um, a couple people from my group have spoken already, but I think something important to consider as we figure out, because like you said, we can't solve all the world's problems in such a short period of time. But I think something important to consider is the amount of pressure we put in addressing these problems and issues on particular groups. So like. All of these items shouldn't fall on one department or one organization or student clubs, especially when those are organizations based on people of color who are already dealing with a variety of trauma and difficulties throughout. So I think it's important with that. And part of uh, committing to like legitimate action, I think would be incorporating some of the ideas and plans we have into like our strategic vision putting out statements on plans for events and things like that. I know Karen in our group had mentioned the strategic vision the university has. So I think it'd be important to incorporate some of that in there. Good point, Tom. So uh, we got Ronnie and then Janae, and then we'll, we'll close it out. Go ahead, Ronnie. Sorry. All right. So quickly, I definitely agree with Tom's point. I think it um, just personally has to be an intentional and integrated like approach and it has to be campus wide from faculty, staff to students. I think he, I agree, there's a lot of pressure to put on students to kind of right the wrongs of how long, however long your institution has been open. Um, I will say in regards to our group, we they brought up a good point of alumni um, and like making sure that they're in the conversation because alumni, of course, A, pay back in regards to funding and B, they, they give a historical context. So some things that we think are new issues, they can probably shed a little light in history on what has happened or has not happened. Um, also bringing up just funding and resources for some of these organizations. Um, a couple people have brought up the uh, Black Alumni Panel. And a lot of that was kind of like student um, generated. So supporting different programs and events like that. And then another one of our colleagues uh, brought up just communication. Um, we got folks like ROTC and stuff uh, right across the street. Are they being incorporated? Are they being connected with some of these programming efforts as well? And then I personally would say um, intentional approach to uh, onboarding and mentoring. And the biggest thing is we can get numbers in, but if you don't have their representation or support once they get here and be retained, they will just go out the next year. So making sure that we're very intentional about how we create a welcoming experience when they're onboarding and like what does that level of mentorship and support look like? Absolutely, Ronnie, thank you. All right, Janae, I'm unmuting you, uh, iPhone, go for it. Hi, um, my name is Janae, and one thing that we talked about in um, our group was um, educating ourselves on how to educate others um, and the right way to go about it. And I'm still educating myself, as I told my group. So um, I didn't get the chance to um, say this because the time had ran out, but Vanessa, I applaud the way you're able to educate all of us, you know, in a way that everyone can understand without um, letting your emotions get in the way. So I, I'm trying, you inspire me in that aspect. Um, also to piggyback off of, I think, uh, Rebecca and the aspect of mental health um, in the black community, we don't really speak of our mental health. It's um, not something that is a conversation in our everyday lives. And um, that honestly wasn't something that crossed my mind mental health until I got out on my own and came to school. So I think it's definitely um, something that we should endure and preserve is our mental health. So thank you all for giving me the chance to speak 
and um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we did have a couple more folks raise their hand and I'm, I would like to, to honor them and their, their thoughts. Um, if y'all have to leave, you know, it's after 6.30, feel free to do so, but um, I'll stick around as long as folks are willing to talk here. Go ahead, Joanne, you should be unmuted. Our group, um, yeah, our, our group, our, I, we didn't have a moderator, I don't believe, but um, Leroy had some great things to say if he would like to say something about it as well. Um, we need a chief diversity officer. Um, and as someone was saying, we need to have diversity back in our strategic plan. Um, when we had a diversity um, office in the president's office, which I ran a bunch of years ago, we had a lot of programming and we even won the ABET Diversity Award for 2008. Um, we had the diversity lecture series, which was very helpful. We had a program called Breaking Bread, which brought two disparate groups together over dinner, which was funded. We also had a grant program that allowed for students, student groups in particular to be supported. Um, we can't leave it to the students, as uh, Tom was saying, um, the burden is too great. We need to have places like the hub um, for students to congregate and to be, um, you know, to feel safe. We need to do um, faculty cluster hires at um, historically black colleges and universities. And as Ronnie said, we just can't have these cluster hires and then have no retention programs for them because um, Embry-Riddle is extremely white and we need to focus on the race and um, education. Many of us in the humanities do educate um, about race and anti-racism. Um, race is a, actually a cultural construct. Um, it doesn't actually exist. Uh, <laughs> we're all human race. The thing about being colorblind is wrong. Um, everybody sees color and differences should be celebrated, not ignored. So uh, one of the things that we can do is if we have someone at the helm and then we have uh, actual funding and staffing, I think that will bring about um, a great deal of change. We need to have programmatic change, faculty recruiting and retention, student recruiting and retention programs like we had a while back. So thank you very much. I really appreciated everybody's comments um, and thank you for this forum. Thank you for joining. Go ahead, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, I don't see the young woman on my screen. I think her name was Janae talking about um, giving props to someone who was very good at educating folks with a certain demeanor. Um, it obviously should not be on folks of color to educate folks. Um, I will say this, that um, I mentioned in our group, um, one of the programs that we did at the previous institution was called Racial Aikido, which was specifically for the students so that they can learn and understand how to take care of themselves in, a, uh, in these situations and specifically at predominantly white institutions. And um, Another comment regarding a chief diversity officer. I think it's important to understand that um, if that is considered, that a chief diversity officer is very different than um, at least what we learned <laughs> was that they be separated from um, the Title IX, Title VII type legal. Um, they are different they can inform one another but they're very different entities got it thank you kirsten all right natalie yeah so i just kind of wanted to go off of what ronnie mentioned earlier about student organizations being supported um, i think it's really important to put out there that student organizations um, already have a lot of really, really incredible events um, that they do. And the university does need to support them, but we need to be careful that the university is not um, overtaking the event or, you know, trying to downplay the role student orgs have had. 
I think it's really important to note that, you know, I agree with everybody who said, you know, it shouldn't be left up to student orgs and to the students to work on this issue. But a lot of students have been working on diversity and inclusion issues for a long time and haven't necessarily always had university support behind them. Um, so if the university is going to begin supporting student organizations, we need to make sure that it is an actual support and not a way for the university to use their events to benefit their numbers or their goals or however it works. Appreciate you sharing your perspective, Nally. Jamira, you should be good to go. Hi. Uh, so an uh, issue that I wanted to bring up, um, that I think could change in the near future-ish is that, um, yes, the hub is great for us to get to know each other, but it also is kind of out of, like, like it's not part of the main campus. It's like, it is, but it's not. It's like so far away from everything else. Like it takes a good five, five, eight minutes to walk from the hub to the SU. Um, and like, that makes us, like, it makes us feel like, kind of off put you know because we're not like we're not in the center of the campus people don't really get to see us going in and out it's kind of like if we're there we're there if we're not we're not like type thing it's kind of i don't know i just think that um when it comes to places like that i don't think i think they should be more centered um where like where they're placed on campus and i get like a lot of it is pushed what's well, pushed over there because of construction and stuff for the time being um and i hope it's going to move uh to a uh, more centered location on campus, but um, uh, the hub being so out just over there, because it's by the gym and we have to walk around all this construction to even get there. Um, I think I think that also deters a lot of people from, you know, actually going there and actually getting to know a lot of the students, especially now um, with the old uh, UC gone. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay, so uh, throughout this entire meeting, we've mentioned like uh, uh, clubs uh, that center around uh, minorities. Um, I wanted to know if maybe there was a plan to kind of allocate more funds to these clubs, seeing as how they usually are restricted to a budget that sometimes doesn't allow them to do some of the things that they really do want to do to be seen on campus. Um, just as I've been a part, part of a couple organizations over the past year, and uh, sometimes funding goes a long way. Um, like I know Wicked for a fact, like they get all the money they need and you see their presence on campus. They're everywhere. Um, just allocating more funds to some of these uh, other organizations that um, are underrepresented on campus. I, I can answer that for you. <laughs> Um, so Wicked is, is a SGA division and the radio station, so their funding is separate. But um, there is funding available to orgs. Um, it's, not a, it's not limited, so I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, you can apply with um, the SGA for funding. You have two funding opportunities a semester, and there's also the annual fund in the dean's office, um, which is, comes from donations that are unrestricted funds. So there is funding available. So all you have to do is come talk to us and we can point you to the right direction to ask for money. So you can ask for money for travel, for conferences, for getting things for your organization, um, for events. Um, and a lot of times, like we did with coming to Africa, we'll reach out to other departments and ask for support that way. And there'll be departments that will give you money for your events. So you have a lot of resources as far as funding goes. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss it with you um, whenever you'd like. But there is, there is, and it's not limited and you will, you know, I mean, it is limited to, you know, what, what the university has, but it's not limited as in you only get $100 a semester and you're done. It's not that way. Um, so we have a lot of different avenues that we follow to be able to get funding for our um, student organizations. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Nagar. You're welcome. Go ahead, Vanessa. Um, just one point I completely forgot to mention was I think it would be important to have some type of council for um, international students or um, minority students on the SGA who have representatives because I know previously we usually have just like a one international um, students representative who 
works as a liaison of sorts or is involved with um, the SGA. And previously we've not had like um, very good representation because there have been instances where you have an international student representative who's never met your um, e-board, who has not taken the time to actually go around and see all the issues that may affect um, the minority organizations. I think it would be great if we had a council or a committee of international and minority students so that they can have their uh, concerns or whatever issues that they may be having. So it's a direct conduit to the SGA rather than having one person represent uh, an umbrella of people. And it's, it's not easy to have just one person do that. Um, and I know the global engagement has ISBC, but I feel like global engagement's um, goal is more about um, study abroad rather than actually focusing on the students who are in campus and how can that campus to minority student engagement is. So their purpose from my experience has been how they can get um, white students to study abroad or embryo students to study abroad, but there isn't that specific program that um, deals with how do we interact with our minority students. So if we had some type of committee or um, council that has representations from these minority groups, um, working with SGA, I think that um, would have a lot more effectivity in getting funding. If you say you were not having issues with funding, if you feel like you're not being represented, I think it would be great to have that. Thank you, Vanessa. All right, Eric. Thank you, Sean. Um, I kind of wanted to touch upon a few points. Um, especially the question that Daniel raised and Nagar, she definitely touched upon all the points. Um, I think what's also important is in regards to um, not just RSO student organization uh, funding, um, but uh, reaching back out to your alumni. Um, there are a lot of alumni that were heavily involved in a lot of these student organizations, especially um, a lot of the diversity and inclusion um, specific organizations. and you know, they're in the industry um, and they're more than willing to give back as they, you know, come back for homecoming, they come back for blue and gold week and things of that sort. So definitely finding a way to reach back out to our alumni and figuring out a way to um, give back to our organizations, whether it be through crowdfunding or um, any initiatives that organizations are trying to fundraise for. Um, in regards to um, the ambassador, creating a, an ambassador program. I'm glad, um, Vanessa, you touched upon that. Um, whether it be ambassadors or counselors, I think having student ambassadors or a, a council of students is important because we need more student leaders. Um, the only way that, although we keep saying that, you know, we can't, you know, allow um, all this to fall on the shoulders of the students, it's really the students that are going to help drive this initiative because without the student body, we like there, there is no university, there is no college. Um, so as long as we have student leaders that are willing to help um, faculty, staff and the university help drive this initiative and help, um, you know, promote, you know, engagement on campus and help promote positive change and positive messages across the campus. Um, I think it's definitely going to go a long way. Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you. All right, go ahead, Rebecca, and then we'll, then we'll for real, we're going to close out after, after she's done. Uh, just last thing. So Vanessa, um, I think Jim Myers, he's our SGA president. He's in this chat and he has been working on the diversity and inclusion and trying to create a committee with the international students. And so definitely emailing him would be a first step in creating that committee because it's true. I think we need a lot more representation. Like there are no Korean students in SGA, <laughs> you know, we, we barely see any Chinese students at that. And so I think that would be a big move. And I know that Jim is some, that's something that Jim would be like, would love to work on. And um, yeah, I once again, just kind of want to close this out and just say that I'm very thankful for everyone that came today. I think it is true. Like we have recognized that we have a very imbalanced university and it's awesome to see people who feel that way and who recognize it and want to do something about it. And it's one thing to talk about it and 
and have these chats, but it's also another thing to, to act upon those words that we have shared today. I mean, every single thing that a group has said has been different than the one before. And that is something important to recognize as well. And I just want everyone to go from today and, and to really act on that, to find the resources. Like we'll have the chat out um, that we'll send out. You'll have all the emails of everyone that you need to. And I just really hope that going into the fall that we'll keep this momentum going because a fire isn't just sustained by just wood or just oxygen or just heat. You know, it takes several components to keep a good fire running. And that's what we have to keep going because I mean, we want our university to progress. We want to see diversity. We want to see color. And that is what we need to work on. And I'm very, very grateful for all of you. I do pray that you guys are all staying safe and healthy as well. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to all who, who came today. Um, I encourage you to continue to learn, to grow, to share, you know, to celebrate the, the wonderful nature of all of us as an Embry-Riddle family and more importantly as a human family. Uh, and I did want to put out one more reminder that if you, if you do want to receive, you know, I guess future correspondence, this chat and stuff like that, um, send your email to one of the admins, one of the hosts, and um, we're not going to post it in the chat, but we'll, we'll get that later and send it to you. Um, and then also this Saturday on campus from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, there's going to be a peaceful protest going on uh, making sure to follow campus and CDC guidelines to make sure that you're safe. And so um, that would be a wonderful way to get out and show support. Um, I would absolutely be there, but I'm going to be in Texas with my family on that day. But I, I encourage anyone else who may be in town to swing by and, and show some good support. Again, thank you all so much for your time today. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work together in the future to, to growing and bettering the Embry-Riddle family. Have a good evening. <laughs>